Good evening, or good afternoon, and welcome to the June 25th, 2024 Board of Aldermen Work Session. Um, I ask Alderman Royal, it's not on the agenda, but I think it's always a good idea, if you don't mind, open us up in a word of prayer, please. Yes, sir, Mayor. Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity, again, to discuss city business, again, to look at all possibilities that we can enhance the quality of life for our citizens. We thank you for your guidance, we thank you for your wisdom, and we thank you for innovative, creative ideas, God, that we can move our city forward. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, if you're able to stand, please do so as we pledge allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, then we take the offer. <laughs> offer in time? Yes, how, about a roll, how about a roll call? Let's do that one. Alderman Creel? Here. Alderman Royal? Here. Alderman Astor? Here. Mayor Odom? Here. Alderman Kinsey? Here. Alderman Best? Alderman Brinson? I believe uh, both Alderman Best and Brinson are in route and will be here momentarily. So at this time, I will turn this over to Mr. Huge. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, I'd like to ask Kim Ostrom to in in introduce her guest, and we'll start this presentation. Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce you. I'm Cole, Senior Vice President of the Avenue Public Finance and John Hines, Can you turn on your Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Ted Cole with Davenport. John Mize is here as well as, as Kim introduced. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about finance-related matters, uh, John about legal-related matters, but we do tend to dabble in each other's professions a little bit, but I'll defer to him wherever uh, a legal question comes up. And we very much would like to keep this um, conversational, so if you have any questions along the way, please stop us. Um, there is material in front of you, and I believe it might be what's on the screen. Um, either way, it's the same, and there are page numbers in the bottom right corner of a printed material. Oh, I see. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So as, as, uh, as Kim said, we're going to talk about a general obligation bond referendum, but we're also going to share some other um, information related to other types of debt um, and we're going to talk about as she alluded to the the city's debt capacity that is your ability to take on debt within certain measures or policies or benchmarks and we're also going to talk about debt affordability that is how do you repay the debt service that's due they're related concepts but they don't always line up in other words Many local governments have ample debt capacity. They can take on debt and still have a very solid financial profile and look very creditworthy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have the money in their budget to repay that debt. So debt capacity versus debt affordability. And we're going to talk about the process for a GEO bond referendum. And technically, by the law, and I'm going to just very high level, you don't really need to start that process till next spring. There are certain things you have to do by statute that, for the most part, kick off in the April, May of 2025 timeframe for a fall of 25 vote. 
But there are a number of things that you might consider getting started with earlier as you discuss things internally as, as a board and, and as a community about what are the goals of the referendum. There's some very specific categorizations of projects and questions that you would ultimately put to the voters that John can speak about. There's a very, um, um, a very defined process with the Local Government Commission in Raleigh when you do want to proceed with a bond referendum that we have to follow. So there is often a lot of planning work that goes into the process well before the first legal requirement hits, again, that would be somewhere in the April-May of 2025 time frame. If you go to page, uh, this says page five. Anyhow, um, it's page three in the book. I'm not sure how that, let me just make sure. I'm Oh, you got a couple of intro slides. Um, anyhow, uh, if you're looking at the hard copy, bottom right says three, but on the screen it says five. Anyhow, uh, just wanted to introduce all the different ways that you might fund capital projects. Um, clearly, you could just spend cash, right? You have reserves, you have current year revenue, and you want to spend it on uh, capital projects. Um, that's a very straightforward way of doing it. Um, what we're here to talk about today is a general obligation bond. That does require a voter referendum. And as we said, it requires you to take a number of legal steps ahead of the vote, and it requires you to develop uh, bond questions that will go on the ballot that are pretty specific about the purpose and the nature of what you want the voters to consider. Um, the If it's approved, um, you will be issuing that debt, and it'll be backed by your full faith and credit and your taxing authority. And, and it's really the best credit that any local government can give to an investor or a bondholder because you're legally required to raise taxes if you don't have the revenue to repay the debt. So it's a very, very um, cost-effective and efficient way to fund projects. The other nuance about it is you're not required to pledge any real property collateral for the loan, right? Non-voted debt, which you've done before, installment financing, things like that, you might put a mortgage on a facility as the security for the bondholder, but it's not backed by your full faith and credit. In other words, you don't have to vote that type of debt. With a GO bond, you don't have to give any real property collateral <coughs> the security that the bondholder has is your taxing authority, your full faith and credit is what we call it. Um, when a bond issue is taken to the voters and if it's approved, um, you have seven years to issue that debt. You're not required to issue the debt, but you have seven years to issue the debt and oftentimes you can get a three-year extension if you need more than seven years to issue the debt. You would go to the local government commission for a three-year extension. But from a planning perspective, you should be thinking about it as we go to the voters, if it's approved, we've got seven years to issue the debt. And you don't have to issue it all at once. You can issue it in pieces as your projects are ready to go. Um, the other important part of that is if the voters say no, if they don't approve the referendum, then you, know, you will have some limitations about if you can even move forward with those projects and when, because you'll have to go to the local government commission. Obviously, you'll have to deal with the community. And so I think you need to be careful as you're doing the work about what are we going to ask the voters to approve? Uh, what if they were to say no? What does that do to our capital plan? What does that do to that particular project or that type of project? If they say no, do we still need to pursue it? And that could create challenges at a lot of different levels. Um, again, if the referendum were, um, were to fail. And that takes us to a couple of other types of financing, uh, the installment financing that I talked about. That is not voter approved. You have to hold a public hearing. You all have to adopt a couple of resolutions. You have to go to the local government commission. Um, and oftentimes it's secured by an asset, a building, a piece of property, a vehicle, uh, equipment, what have you. So you've got... Um, a, a very good financing option that doesn't require voter approval 
for certain projects if you determine that you know you you want to pursue financing the project uh, without going to referendum that installment financing sometimes can be difficult particularly if you're doing projects like streets and sidewalks or parks and rec greenway type activities that maybe don't lend themselves to really good collateral they're not a building or a piece of equipment they're they're a, a, a public street or a sidewalk or a, a greenway trail and sometimes if you're going to issue debt for that type of project that more nebulous collateral can be difficult to get a lender for because it's you know it's it's just not discreet it's not a building or a piece of equipment so each of these financing options has pros and cons and different challenges depending on what you're funding um, revenue bonds as Kim mentioned you all have issued revenue bonds before mostly related to water sewer electric you're pledging revenues of that system no referendum required and then there's a, a another not often used um, but but we do see it from time to time called a special obligation bond that's might be where you issue bonds for a certain project and what you're going to secure that loan with is a pledge of a non-tax revenue of the city so for example you might get sales tax distributions from the state or the county that's not your tax that's their tax but you get the revenue you can pledge that revenue against a special obligation so there are a whole host of, of funding types and methods geo is what we're going to focus on today but you might evolve as you're thinking about all the things you want to do what projects do we want to include in the referendum what projects don't we and that might be based upon the the, the necessity of the project we got to do it no matter what or it might be based on the type of project and does it lend itself to financing through some other method yes question what would be the maximum of the minimal of projects that you can add to this two or three or just one I, I for, a, for a referendum yes um, it can be any number of projects it can be one it can be many and many could be over 10 or 20 I don't think there's any limit what you do, what you will see, and, and maybe John can jump in here as well, is when it, you develop your plan, you have to select certain categories of what you call those bonds. So there's streets and sidewalks as a category, parks and rec, um, public safety might be a category. So you, you, you can't just say we want to vote a bond to cover a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. You have to vote some pretty specific, specific categories, but then whatever fits within that category could be one thing or it could be many things. Okay. And that's, you can, you can keep the question to the voters on the ballot very broad within that purpose, streets and sidewalks, anything in the city, streets, sidewalks, wherever. Or you could be very specific, Main Street. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the pros and cons of getting very specific in the, in the referendum question versus um, more broadly written question. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thank you. Um, all right, let me go. Page four in your book, page six on the screen, a little bit of an additional overview. Um, some of this I have already covered. Um, citywide election, obviously, so I think what we're talking about is uh, October October of 25 would be the next opportunity here um, we talked about stating the purpose uh, the maximum amount for the purpose you you'll have to establish that ultimately in the bond question and in different public hearings and resolutions that you will ultimately consider um, action on in the future so specific amounts um, and as I said, specific purposes. And, and we mentioned a few of those that I've already talked about here. Parks and rec, streets and sidewalks, for example. Um, let me see here. Um, you cannot combine multiple purposes. Um, I think some of this is pretty self-explanatory that we just talked about. Seven years, if the vote is approved, you have seven years to issue it. You can extend it for three. 
Um, if there happen to be two or three bond questions on the referendum, so you've got a streets and sidewalks and a park and rec, uh, one can pass and one, you know, it, they stand on their own. They, they are voted on individually. So, um, you know, each of those will be voted and tallied and, and um, you'll move forward accordingly. Okay? Um, I guess the last thing I would say here is um, as a board, um, you can spend money and time in public education about a referendum. I think I'll say that, hopefully say this right, but not in advocation for or against the, the bond. So, so I have a question for you on that. I did not realize that the city could only do this at the time we're having our election. So I appreciate that information. But the second piece is, can a candidate expend their campaign funds to promote the bond referendum? Or is that a question for another that's attorney? Probably a question for okay. All right. Bond side, that's not an issue. What we frequently see is what they're on. Yeah. Okay. Could you come to the speaker, please? I, I can't hear you. Uh, the question was, could you use campaign funds, personal campaign funds, to, in, to advocate for it? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I know there's no – under the bond law, it doesn't address that. That would be a campaign finance question. But you frequently see local chambers put together campaigns funded kind of outside of the town's coffers to support, to engage folks to come out for the election. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so there is a, a line at which uh, public funds being used for education versus advocacy. Um, if you turn to page five, um, you'll see that there has been over the last couple of years at the state level uh, um, an initiative to put, I guess I'd call it, more transparency to bond questions, more information for voters to have at their disposal when making a decision. and sort of left and right, uh, what we'll call the previous uh, ballot question was short and sweet, um, not a lot there. Uh, that's how it had been done for many, many years. But under new legislation, there is more information required to be on the ballot. And there's also some additional steps that have to be taken um, early on in the process. As I said, dealing with the Local Government Commission, none of which is terribly difficult. We have to do certain calculations for what the interest expense will be over the term of the debt if it were to be issued. We have to make very clear what our assumptions were in making those estimates. In other words, was it a 20-year term? What interest rate did we use? Just more information about um, the bond and the impact on the city's budget, the impact on a property owner so they have more information at their disposal when making a decision about and the question. That, and that plays a great role as well as upon the lender, what the interest rate is going to be for us. Correct. And, and the Local Government Commission has provided guidance on um, what they call the safe harbor assumptions, meaning if you use these assumptions for interest rate, for example, um, the Local Government Commission will find that your process met their standards. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they take the, the highest interest rate for a North Carolina general obligation local government bond, I think in the last 20 years, it's around 5.3%. So their guidance to us is when you're running analyses for your clients about a referendum and the debt service on a referendum and how it fits in their budget, if you use these assumptions for interest rates, um, we, the LGC, will be able to put this forward to the commission itself as having met the safe harbor requirements. Um, it used to be that you submit an application to the local government commission to have a referendum, and they accept it and approved it oftentimes, if not always, before the referendum even took place. So like in September or October with a referendum in November submitted the application, they approved it, and then they waited to see what the referendum. Now the commission waits to do their approval until after the vote, 
so that they're not viewed as having endorsed it in some way. So you have a, a vote of the people. You submit your application in September, October, or even earlier. They hold it. They acknowledge they received it. You have the vote, and then the commission considers approval of your bonds. And in order to not have a misstep with the voters approving it and the commission having trouble, they suggest that you follow those safe harbor guidelines. And, and we would walk you through all of that when the time comes, ourselves and, and John and his colleagues, to make sure that we're doing everything in accordance with these newer statutes and we, we don't find when it does arrive to the Local Government Commission on their agenda that we have a miscommunication about what was shared with the voters versus what the commission has seen or wants to see. Okay? Question. Question. Yeah. Are we mandated by the North Carolina session law, I, I'm assuming, that with these, with the average voter, these sample ballot questions are not reader friendly? Or do we have the ability to paraphrase or we have to use these verbatim? Statute, uh, there, there's room for slight modification, but the statute is pretty clear that you have to use this form. So, um, what you can do in voter education is maybe, you know, that's where a, a lot of elected bodies or municipalities and counties try to educate voters, but the ballot question is prescribed by the statute. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, page six. Um, there is a more detailed calendar in the back of the book, but this hits some of the highlights. And you'll notice that we're starting in the fall of 24. This is really kicking that off, I think. I know you all have discussed this over the last several weeks, but um, the, the bond amounts, the projects, the questions being analyzed and refined, I kind of see this as maybe the kickoff, educating you all about the process and going through the fall, even into the winter and early spring, you all developing a plan for the referendum. And again, it's what are the questions that we're going to want to put to the voters, how much is included in each amount, um, and whatever detail you feel you want to share with the community about what those projects might be that would be funded um, if, the vote, if the bonds were approved. So, we're, we're sort of developing that plan of finance um, over the next several months so that by the time you get to May of 2025, you're ready to go and, and execute the required legal steps of the referendum. And, and you'll see they really start off in around May of 25, finalizing the questions and the amounts. Then there's a series of legal filings. Um, uh, uh, public hearing, I believe, um, submitting the application to the Local Government Commission, getting everything over to the uh, Board of Elections and all of that by certain deadlines. And ultimately, um, in this case, I guess it would be October 14th of 2025 would be when the vote would take place. Um, if it's approved, the initial authorization of seven years would start then and it would be it would expire in 2032 unless you got a three-year extension which again the local government commission we've seen it they they usually award those extensions pretty freely but it's not guaranteed so you have seven years to issue following the vote and then you can request an extension okay uh, that's kind of all high level, not necessarily Newbern specific. Any questions on that before we get into some of the discussion about your debt profile and some beginning discussions re regarding debt capacity and debt affordability? Okay. So we're going to go to page 10. Um, the city is not currently rated. You don't carry a bond rating. That is not a indicative of not being credit worthy. I think you're very credit worthy. It's because you don't have any bonds outstanding that carry a bond rating. You have in the past, uh, you had bonds that were rated uh, A3 at the time. 
those bonds matured, they got paid off at their final maturity, and that rating was withdrawn. And again, that's not an action that indicates a, a problem with your credit, it's just that the bonds were no longer outstanding, and that's what the rating agency rate is a bond, not just a broad rating on a city or a county. So you're, in, you're going into this without a bond rating, if the referendum is approved, you may determine that you want to establish the bond rating when you're ready to issue the first piece of debt, the first, the first general obligation. Um, because you're not rated, you have a little flexibility. We might find that issuing the GO bond to a bank without a rating makes sense. You have some latitude to do that. But oftentimes we see it with a community that doesn't have a bond rating, if they have a referendum, if it's approved and they're ready to go to the market with their first borrowing, they would, they would establish their bond rating. And that, that all fits within a financing timetable from the moment you all say, if it's approved, we're ready to get started, we want to borrow $5 million or $10 million. Uh, it's about a 90-day process to issue the debt, and the rating would be established in that 90-day process. Would that rating affect the uh, process of the, um, the the interest rate on that? That's that's really the the biggest um, impact that the rating would have is when we go to the market, where we're rated will um, impact um, the interest rate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, higher rating, lower interest rate. No matter what the market is, that's a good correlation. Um, and you'll see on the chart on the left, AAA is the highest rating that any local government can achieve, uh, local government, state, federal. Um, then there's three levels of a AA rating, three levels of a single A rating, and then you get down into the triple B rating, which we rarely see in local governments in North Carolina and in the mid-Atlantic. On the right-hand side, just introducing some comparisons, we subscribe to a database that Moody's maintains, and you'll see in the upper right, um, cities and towns, they rate 240 cities and towns as AAA, over 1,200 as AA, and over 400 as single A. Within North Carolina, right below it, cities and towns, I'm not talking about counties, um, 16 AAAs, 22 AA's, and no single A's. So Moody's only rates 38 cities and towns in North Carolina, and there's hundreds of them. So there are many cities and towns that don't have ratings. And you'll also see of those they rate, all of them are either in the AA or AAA um, category. And, you know, they look at a lot of different things. I'm very comfortable saying, I think, when we talk about the city of New Bern, having worked with you for a number of years and knowing your financials and your economy and, and different parts of, of what the rating agencies would look at. I think we're talking about a double A city. It's just a question of you in that sort of low, middle, or upper double A. But again, nothing that you're talking about doing now requires a rating. <laughs> to have the referendum, you don't need a rating. That would only become uh, a, a, a task if, you dis if the vote, voters approve the debt and you, you go to the market. And again, it would be done as part of the issuance process. Okay. If, a, if the decision is ultimately made to go for a rating, do you apply to all three rating agencies or, or do you pick and choose which one you want to? You, it, it, you have complete discretion over that. One, two, three, and now there's a fourth that's starting to get a little more traction called Kroll, K-R-O-L-L, -L, but they are a much lesser used entity. Moody's and Standard & Poor's are the most broadly used Fitch is sort of um, third, if you will, in terms of, of market share. You can choose who to go to, and because you don't have a rating now, you have the ability to go and get your first rating on a confidential basis. So you can get the rating from them and then make a determination, do you want to move forward with that in the bond market? So you have a little more latitude having not, because you don't have a rating, uh, but you have complete flexibility on who you go to. Generally, though, once you establish your, your rating, let's say with Moody's and S&P, you would normally continue to use them every time you go to the market. Now, I'm not talking about bank financing. If you get a rating 
and you issue GO bonds to the bond market, that's fine. But the next year you say, you know, we just want to go borrow a small amount of money from the bank. You're still allowed to do that, and you don't need to get that rated. It's only when you go to that bond market where you have underwriters and investors that are buying uh, pieces of your bonds that you would need the rating. But generally, complete flexibility on who you use, but once you establish your ratings, you usually use the same ones going forward. How many people can buy in a bond? How many? They are sold in $5,000 denominations, so you can have many, many bondholders that ultimately own your bonds in right. the market, and they can continue to buy and sell them amongst each other long after right. you issue. Mm -hmm. And we break that into two major categories. There's institutional investors, so money market funds, municipal bond funds, um, insurance companies, they buy a lot of municipal bonds and they buy them in big quantities. But you also have individuals, what we call retail, and people that might buy a few bonds here or there for their portfolio. So it's a pretty broad range, but um, you know it's in 5,000 increments. So depending on the size of your deal, you can have many, many individual bondholders. OK, so you're, th we're going to come back to these peers because it'll help you understand how you currently compare on debt. Um, I did want to show you on page 9 in the book, 11 on the slide, um, the current tax-supported debt outstanding. So we're not talking about utility debt here, not talking about water, sewer, or electric. We're talking about tax-supported debt. Um, all in, you've got about $22 million of debt outstanding. None of that is GO bonds, right? Hasn't been, no, none of that's been voted installments, lobs, or cops, uh, whether it's long-term or vehicle or equipment, it's all basically the same. It's all for you. It's, it's loans you've placed with a bank that you've secured with some asset, whether it's a building, a vehicle, piece of equipment, what have you. So it's sort of a mortgage-style loan. You have a public hearing, resolution, and you issue the debt. So $22 million of debt outstanding. You can see what it looks like graphically in the upper left. Every bar is a fiscal year, uh, so we're just getting ready to start 2025. And you can see what the annual debt service is on the right-hand side, what we call the long-term debt. Uh, it's basically everything except the vehicles. You know, the annual payment in the upcoming year is about $2.3 million, and it's stepping down, and then it steps up, but then it steps down annually, 2028 and beyond. The vehicle debt is shorter because you usually only do that over four or five years, you're paying about $950,000 a year, and then it steps down. When we start talking about the affordability of new debt, we start with this debt profile, right? We want to know what does the new debt look like when we layer it in on top of what we have. Um, and, and what's nice is you generally have a declining debt structure. So every year, for the most part, 20, after 2027, your annual payment for the existing debt is going down, which is creating some affordability for the new debt. And when we do this analysis, we're going to exclude the vehicle debt. Because what you'll see in 2030, you have a $700,000 drop, right, in the vehicle debt. But the reality is you're probably going to fill that with another vehicle loan next year or the following year. So we don't want to um, use that big decline in the vehicle debt to help afford the GO bonds in our planning work only to find that you, you issue another vehicle loan behind it. So when we start talking about your debt profile and the debt affordability, we're only going to look at that long-term debt. The far right column, uh, this is a debt ratio that's commonly looked at by the rating agencies in particular. Uh, you do uh, might consider a policy for that going forward. It's called the 10-year payout ratio. And essentially what it's measuring in a percentage is 10 years from now, how much of this $22 million will have been repaid? Higher is better, means you're amortizing the debt more quickly. You're not backloading the debt. So what it's telling us is 10 years from now, 79% of this debt will have been repaid. And that's very strong. It indicates a rapid repayment schedule. 
three different debt ratios we look at on page 10 or page 12 in your uh, screen. All of these are telling us that the city has debt capacity. Uh, not unlimited. There is a limit to how much debt you can issue. But you have, a, I'll call it a fair amount of debt capacity, as many local governments do. In other words, on paper, under certain ratios, we can demonstrate that you can take on new debt in the future and still have a very solid debt profile. But again, that doesn't mean it's affordable. It doesn't mean you have the money in your budget to make the payment. So we establish first what is our capacity. And when you look at these three ratios across the top, whether it's the 10-year payout, which you want higher, you would want that above the policy range, which you are now, debt to assess value in the middle, debt outstanding as a percent of your tax base, you want that lower. And debt service to expenditures on the right, how much of your annual budget is going to debt payments, you want that lower. In all of these cases, you are better than the typical policy range, which means you could take on some additional debt and still be in compliance with what we would consider to be a very solid policy. And the, the charts at the bottom are telling you well, how would we compare to these other rated communities, right? And Newburn is at the top in gold. And on that, on that bottom chart in the bottom left, you want your gold bar further to the right. And you can see you compare very well, whether we're comparing you to the cities and towns nationally in light green or the cities and towns within North Carolina in the dark green. You're in really good shape. Same in the middle. However, you don't want your bar to the right, you want it smaller, and you compare very well, again, to both the cities and the uh, U.S. and in North Carolina that carry those AAA and AA ratings, likewise on the far right. So I guess the, the takeaway before I move on is, again, while you don't have policies in place today, that might be something that we want to put in place going forward. We've identified what the range would likely be that we would recommend, and in all of them, you are stronger than the recommended policy. You compare well to other places that are highly rated. And the, and the takeaway would be the city has capacity. This is all a very reasonable conversation to be having about the potential to be issuing debt in the future. OK? All right. So now we want to talk about, sorry, it's a little hot here for me. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the repayment plan. Right? So if you look at page 11 in the book, um, this is very simple. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, we're looking at fiscal year, starting with fiscal year 25, the year we're about to go into. And that current long-term tax-supported debt payment is under column B as in boy. We know we have to make those payments. That's debt we've already committed ourselves to. We have placeholders in C and D for new debt. We're going to fill that in in a moment with a potential $10 million borrowing for starters. Um, so right now, column E is just simply restating column B as in boy. That is the debt service payments you have to make on the long-term debt you've already issued. Column F is how you're paying for it. It's a general fund appropriation equal to $2.3 million. So your, your current year payment in 25 is 2.3 million, and you have 2.3 million identified in your 25 budget to make that payment. So you, it's perfectly balanced in the upcoming year, fiscal 25. But then the, the debt starts to step down, steps up a year, but then it steps down annually. And you can see under column H, all we're doing is comparing the payment under E and the revenues under G. And you can see in column H, every year is positive. So the point of what we're saying here is if you can continue to appropriate that same $2.3 million a year every year going forward, even though your actual payments are coming down, you're going to be setting yourselves up to have some money to help pay for the next debt issue, a geo bond in this scenario. Right? So it's just getting to a budgeting practice where just because your debt drops a couple hundred thousand dollars one year, you might decide as part of the plan, keep the funding level flat so we don't lose that and it'll help us better afford the next 
debt issue or the next project. And, and that column H is where we would start with what's our affordability. If you were to budget that way, column H represents dollars that could be used to help offset new debt going forward. Okay? All right, so as I said, we're going to look at a generic $10 million borrowing. And this is going to get to not only helping you understand how do you afford that, but it's also going to give you a little bit of insight to some of the things that we'll be doing as part of the Local Government Commission's process for issuing debt and, and making an application. So we've done this very, very simply. We picked $10 million because it's a nice round number. And we're going to assume that it's issued in fiscal year 26, right? So if you have a referendum in the fall of 25, that's fiscal 26, we issue in next spring, right? Spring of 26, we issue the debt. The voters approve it. Let's go issue $10 million in the spring of 26. The typical general obligation repayment is a 20-year term with what we call level principal. So you can see that $500,000 a year of principal over 20 years is 10 million, and the interest starts at 534, and it steps down every year. So the total payment is a little over a million dollars in the first year. And, and that would occur in fiscal year 27. So you vote in it's October or November of 25. October of 25, voters approve it. You issue the bond six months later, spring of 26 and you make your payments starting in fiscal 27. And under the LGC's guidance of using this rate of the safe harbor rate, it's footnoted there at 5.344%, very specific rate. Um, the first year's payment would be a million 34. And in a vacuum, that would equal about two pennies on your tax rate. Each penny on your tax rate today is generating about $494,000. That's the revenue generated from a penny. We're assuming a 1% growth rate in your tax base, not talking about revaluation, just a conservative growth rate. And by 2027, in order to make a payment of a million 34, you would need a little over two pennies. So in a, and I'm not talking about the prior slide where I said you keep budgeting the same 2.3 million every year, just in a vacuum, what is a $10 million GO 20 year equal to in pennies, a little over two pennies, okay? And that's one way to measure the affordability of, of debt, is just to do it this way, very simple, and that's ultimately information that has to come out and be discussed and disclosed as part of the referendum process. Taxpayer, you can anticipate this $10 million bond that we're asking you to approve would carry the equivalent of two pennies on your tax rate, okay? But there may be another way that we want to look at this. And this is why it's so nice about starting, potentially starting this process so early is there's a lot of iterations of the planning models, a lot of scenarios that I'm sure you all are going to want to look at. You start thinking about, all right, how do we plan for this? Well, we got to figure out what the questions are, how much do we want to ask the voters to approve, and then when would we issue that if they approved it? Because we got seven years. You're unlikely to I issue all of that at once at the front. It's unlikely you'll do it all at the end. So we got to make some assumptions about how that debt is issued over that seven-year period. All of those things will influence the outcome of the affordability of that debt. And so what we've done is we've taken that same $10 million and said, Let's layer that in on top of the existing debt. 20-year term, 5.3%. If you borrow $10 million in the very bottom right, you'll see principal plus interest over the life of the loan is $15.6 million. Okay? You'll see on the next slide, page 15, that if you did that and we go back and revisit those debt ratios and potential policies, they all work. Yes, your debt profile grows a little bit, but none of them breach the proposed policy level. And in fact, you still have a fair amount of room within those policy levels um, on top of the 10 million. So it would just be our way of saying, 
this hypothetical 10 million clearly fits within your capacity. But let's talk about the affordability. And what we've done on page 16 is we have circled back to that, that, that um, earlier slide, right, where we have under column B as in boy the existing long-term debt, right? That's exactly what we looked at a few slides ago. C is the new debt associated with this $10 million hypothetical borrowing. So column B plus C equals column E, and that would be what your new debt schedule would look like including existing obligations plus this hypothetical 10 million that would be issued in fiscal 26. That's your new debt burden, debt schedule. Column F, we've got the same exact revenues as the prior version, $2.3 million a year. Let's just hold that flat into the future. And what you see under column H is you have a number of years that are red and in bracketed, you're short, right? And then we equate that to pennies, and it's all in under column J. It's actually about 1.75 pennies. So we've essentially measured the affordability of this 10 million two ways. Hypothetically, it's the equivalent of two pennies. But when we build it into this model with the decline in the existing debt and holding your budgeting for debt constant, it's actually about... 1.75 pennies. So it's just a way to fine-tune the planning work a little bit to try to give perhaps a more exact um, calculation of the impact of the vote, of the referendum, um, and just be a little more understanding for you all as to, as you go through the different iterations that you want to see, how does accelerating the debt issuance process impact us versus slowing it down? Quick question, uh, yes. what interest rate will we be looking at at, at that? So every, everything we're assuming in here is that safe harbor rate of 5.3. Okay. That's what the LGC suggests okay. we use. But in reality, if you are in the market today, you're going to be under 4%. But when the time comes to go through this process, they want you to I, I suppose you can you can use a series of other assumptions, but you run the risk when your referendum goes to the local government commission following the vote that they don't appreciate or agree with some of the assumptions you made, right? If you say, well, I want to use 3% interest rate, their position may be you've underestimated the impact of these bonds. So that's why they're suggesting this 5.3%. But today, you would be a full, gosh, almost 1.5% below that, which would make all of these numbers look better. And that's oftentimes something that we're asked to do is run us this scenario using the safe harbor information so we understand what has to, what, what, what we look like under the local government commission's guidelines or recommended practices, but also show us what it actually looks like in the market so that you have perspective. And that might be something that you would share with the community when the time comes. We're required to disclose this, but we also want you to understand that it's a very conservative approach and we might actually do better. So, so just for simplification purposes, <clears throat> vehicles are not factored in this calculation. Correct. So we're only looking at existing capital expenditure debt, less vehicles. So what you're saying is, theoretically, based off of this inflated interest rate that we're required to look at, right. we could borrow $10 million and we would need to raise the tax rate 1.75 cents. That's correct. Okay. You're exactly right. Or you would need to find the revenue equal to that 1.75 cents. Like so, I said, we would need to raise the tax rate 1.75 <laughs> right. percent. The, the, the column H there, those red numbers, is that's the gap we're trying to fill. Okay. And with a penny generating approximately five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and and you, if you were to do that, um, there will come a time where you start to have some more borrowing capacity behind that ten million that wouldn't require additional revenue, right? Because remember how that debt is projected to be issued. It's the first year hits you the hardest there if you're looking on your screen. Y'all have the screen in front of you? Yes. Yeah. If you're looking in the screen in that upper left, 
FY27 is your biggest year, and then it starts to step down. So there will come a time, even with the 10 million, even with the 1.75 pennies you need to fund it, a couple of years later, you start to have some additional affordability. That's the beauty of that level principle structure. Hits you the hardest on the first year, yes, but it does help have a decline structure. So you always have a little bit of money that could be freed up for something else. All right, last concept here. Uh, hopefully this is all digestible. I'm on page 18. Uh, we've run four cases. These are really pretty simple now that we've gone through some things. The first case is, what if we don't dedicate any new revenue to this uh, endeavor? How much could we borrow and win under our current debt structure and our current budgeting practices? Case two is, what if we were to dedicate the equivalent of one penny, a new penny's worth of revenue, Beginning in fiscal 27, again, that would be the budget. FY27 budget would be the first budget y'all would work on following the referendum. So referendums approved. Case 2 says beginning in 27 budget, we're going to dedicate an additional one penny. Case 3 is an additional three pennies. Case 4 is an additional five pennies. Again, just hypothetical. What does that do for us? in terms of affordability under that standard 20-year 5.3% assumption. And page 19 or 21 on the slide, on the screen, brings it all together. Uh, looking under case one, we show you without any new revenue beyond what you're already budgeting, how much could you afford to issue in fiscal years 26 to 2030? And down on line seven, it's a little, it's call it 7.7 .7 million. But it doesn't happen all at once. You have to sort of leg into it as the uh, debt is falling off. So there's, there's some affordability, but it's somewhat limited. Case two, if you start dedicating the another one penny's worth of revenue, call it $500,000, beginning in 27, you can see it's thir a little over 13 million, and it's a little more front loaded. So that gives you an idea of what one penny might do to help fund a program like this. And then case three is three pennies additional starting in 27. Helps you with about to fund over that period about 24 and a half million. Case four, five pennies, uh, about 35 million. The, 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 the concept of this, as you all evolve, again, on what are the categories of geo bonds that you might want to ask the voters to consider? How much in each category would you ask them to consider? Five, 10, 15 million, what have you. Um, and over what period of time would you issue that debt? We can start to back into um, you know, what the repayment would look like and what you might need to consider doing in future budgets to bring new revenue into the mix. And again, all of that's got to be vetted and um, put out for your review, for uh, anybody that's going to attend a public hearing or um, ultimately um, vote on the measure. All of these at the bottom half of the chart fit within those three debt policies. So even on the far right, case four, um, Certainly your debt profile changes, right? You've only got $22 million of debt right now. We're talking about the potential of issuing up to 35 more in that case four. But even so, all of those debt ratios are still within the bounds of what we would consider to be a solid policy level. So for y'all, I think, like many places, it's less about do we have the capacity to do this. It's more about... How much do we want to do and when, and how do we make sure we can uh, afford it? We're ready in whatever budget year it is to start repaying that debt. And that's all part of this process that ultimately, as I said, has to be pretty transparent to the voters um, as you go through the legal steps required. And I think I basically summarized my, my observations here on, on page 20 just a moment ago. I mean, 
hopefully this is a good starting point, um, and I, I can imagine conversations, work sessions, um, you know, providing staff with direction. They would provide us with direction on some updates. It's a lot of info, so um, happy to answer questions. Happy to come back after you've had time to digest it. <clears throat> It's a great, it's a great start, great overview, um, very thorough, and uh, certainly has given us plenty to think about as we move forward. So I guess from a staff perspective, um, at some point in time, you're going to look for some direction from the board on whether or not there's an appetite to do this or not, I, I would think would be the first step. And then the next step is if there is, then we would need to start looking at projects and categories and things like that. Is that safe to say? And so based on our conversations um, at previous workshops, it appears that there has been an appetite. And so if there is an appetite, I think what we can do is come back um, in about six weeks or so with, with another workshop and actually start talking about projects that the board can support and going from there. I would just say I've, I've talked to, I don't know, probably a dozen people over the past month while we've talked about tax rates and electric rates and everything else and we've, we've talked about this and I've mentioned this and not one single person has had a negative comment. They like the idea of being able to go to the ballot box, look at a project and say yes I'm willing to pay a penny for this project versus just giving free reign to the board to make those decisions. So everyone I spoke to was very positive. Of course I'm sure there's people out there that's not as we all know. Not everybody's going to agree with it but board have any questions or comments? So, Foster, you said come back in six weeks. What what would you anticipate a meeting in six weeks looking like? Uh, well, what I can tell you now is I, I think what we're definitely looking at is parks and recreation, public safety, street sidewalks, and possibly an appetite for a combined administrative building. What category that would be in, that would be up to discussion. But if the board is in favor of those types of categories, then we can get with staff and we can you individually to see if you have any, any projects that you would like to be included with that <coughs> or any other categories you might be interested in after you look at, at, the, uh, at, at the information on bonds. And then we can bring some projects together, then start looking at, in reality, what are the costs going to be when that time comes to actually start doing that construction. And so again, we said there was no cap on the amount that we can request. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, there is, I'm not aware of a legal path. Um, and you just, obviously we need to, with the financial disclosures required, we have to do the calculation of what the likely impact would be. So there is no legal cap, but we've got to make sure that we can communicate what is the impact on our budget, on our tax rate for whatever amount you land on. And, you know, something we see, I just offer this up, you know, because these bonds would be authorized for a period of seven years, again, you, you don't have to issue it all at once. You can issue it over time. When you're thinking about projects in the fall of 24, the spring of 25, uh, you need to be thinking about, well, this might not be issued for three or four years and the cost of inflation. So that's another challenge with this is, you decide I want to borrow X for a fire station, just hypothetically, and we think that's a, a $10 million project today, anticipating that, you know, that might be three years out and how, do, how does the cost potentially change? So that starts to be part of your thinking process as well to land on what is the amount that would go on the ballot. Um, we oftentimes see people that voted something several years ago and now they're ready to move forward with the project and the construction world is very different and they, they, you know, they didn't vote enough in hindsight. They have to re-engineer, redesign, or find other funding. So that's 
something that I think you'll need to think about as you move forward as well. So we have seven years to issue. Correct. Is, is there a case scenario where someone issued all at one time? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. There are probably a lot of scenarios. Oftentimes with schools, I know you don't do schools, but a county will vote schools, and they'll, you'll see that done over a number of years. But um, for a smaller referendum, and maybe it, the, the question to the voters is one project that you have in mind, or two, and you'll see that happen oftentimes all at once. That would be most cost effective. You certainly, um, yes, you certainly will, s fewer bond issues will allow you to save some issuance costs. Um, the rule of thumb in your planning work for the LGC would be the voters approve the referendum. That in and of itself doesn't pave the way for the LGC to let you issue the debt. They want to see that when you issue the debt, you have projects ready and are bid to move forward. So there is a little bit of a governor that they have to say, yes, the voters approved X million, but we only we don't think you're ready to issue all of that. You can issue a piece of it because only one project's ready. So um, while it's more efficient to issue it all at one time, you save some money. Practically speaking, the local government commission might slow you down and make you break it up, or uh, you might just need to break it up so that you can manage multiple projects at the staff level. Thank you. This may be more of a legal question, but using the example that you've given us, 10 million, um, gets, gets approved by the voters, we go out and borrow $10 million, knowing full well that we're not going to spend $10 million right away. Um, are we able or prohibited from taking that money, investing it, I think we're talking arbitrage, if I'm not mistaken, um, knowing that in year one we're going to spend $2 million. So we've got $8 million that we're investing and then taking the interest off or the yes. earnings off that investment to and put it aside for debt service payment as we yeah. issue more of that eight, you know, and whittle it down. We, it, it, it almost always happens that when you borrow money, you spend it out over time. There are a few <coughs> occasions where you borrow it and you pay, your, you pay for a, a land acquisition and it's all gone, right? But you are able to invest that money um, according to state statutes, right? You've got to invest it like any other public funds. And uh, you're able to earn interest on it up to more or less your borrowing rate. So if you're borrowing at 3.5%, you can invest and keep the interest earnings up to 3.5%. But if you're earning 5%, you might have to return some or all of that extra interest to the IRS. So you are able to earn interest on these bonds if they're tax exempt, but you may not be able to keep all of the interest depending on how quickly you spend it and some other considerations. Um, but you're right, it's that concept of arbitrage and um, we would fully expect under a construction project that you'll borrow money, it will sit, it will be invested, and you'll be able to use that interest earnings generally for whatever the purpose was that the bonds were issued. So if you're building a fire station and you, you earn $200,000 in interest earnings over the construction period, you, you, you can spend that money on the fire station or whatever other question was put to the voters, public safety. Um, you do need, I believe, for tax-exempt borrowing, you need to have an expectation when you borrow the money that you, uh, you will spend that money over a three-year period. So you're, you're really, the LGC will preclude you from doing speculative borrowing just to, to invest the funds, but the tax exempt laws require that at the time of issuance, you have a reasonable expectation to spend the money in a three year period. Many people take longer than that for various reasons, but at the time of borrowing, that's something you need to be prepared to acknowledge. <coughs> 
but you can earn some interest. You just may not be able to keep all of the interest, depending on the borrowing rate of the bonds, how quickly you spend the money. Um, there's different calculations, but some of it you would be able to keep. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Kind of looking at projects and purposes, um, we see people go about this different ways. Sometimes they say, "Here's our list. How would you group these?" Um, sometimes people are more general. General, but we're happy to work with staff on that kind of through this process. Is, Kind of develop your list, and we can kind of put our bond council eyes on it and say, okay, this is a this question, this question, this question, and just to underscore this point that Ted made, we see people do it different ways. Um, you can't be overly broad; you've got to fit within those purposes. But you know, these bonds are going to be out there for seven, maybe ten years, and sometimes it's important to kind of specifically list projects in there. But it's good to have that flexibility because you don't know what it's going to look like five years from now. You may get a grant out of nowhere for a project that you were looking at. So we can share some examples, of streets and sidewalks questions or parks and rec questions, uh, kind of typical ballot questions so you can see generally what that would look like on a, on a ballot. So I was just wanting to do cents on that. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor, if you'd like, if we, we could certainly set a, a work session date if the board would like to. We could do this the uh, first meeting in, in August at four o'clock if you'd like to. Does the board want to figure it out today or take a little time? Let's, we'll, we'll have time to, okay. to call for that. I think uh, if the clerk wants to do what she does so well is send out um, some options maybe and find a time and date that's appropriate for us. Okay, uh, next up is item number two, discussion of signs and markers. Are we going to take a break? Uh, how long do you think? Yeah, I don't think this is going to take long. Oh, okay. ten, ten minutes at the most, I believe. Thanks so much, guys. Thank so, you. Thank you. So we wanted to bring two items up to you uh, for the signs and markers. Uh, recently, staff had, had reached out to us about a request for a Newburn Bear. And the bear is proposed by a business located downtown in front of their business on Craven Street. Uh, the bear would be on the sidewalk in the right of way. And so we haven't had a request for this. And so we're treating this kind of like um, markers and monuments uh, in the right of way. And so we need to get a little direction on um, what the board's take was on a, on a bear. Currently, there downtown, there are two bears in the right of way on the sidewalk. And one is here at City Hall. And the other one is in front of Mitchell's Hardware. And all of those on the city's right of way? That's correct. I know this one is. So they're looking to put this one on the right of way? Yes, sir. They'd like to put it on the sidewalk um, right at the corner of their business in, in front but of we them. But we have already made ourselves clear that we're not going to do that anymore with a marker. So. What's going to give the bad a right to do to do something that we already said we're not going to do? And and this is why we're bringing it up. We we received a request, and so we any any request we get, we're gonna we're gonna let the board be aware of it. Thank you, sir. And where is it they want to put it again? This is at um, 206 Craven Street. So it's right down the street here on the left hand side of the road. And the information did not have the name of the business that Development Services forwarded to us. So, in the, in the past, the ones that have been established already, that what, we didn't have a policy or procedure, so that was a staff, I'm assuming it was before your time, I'm assuming it was a staff decision. So, I'm, I'm not aware during my time of, of a bare request in the right of way being coming to the board, and the clerk may, may want to talk to that. No, they were first put out, if you remember in 2010 as part of the 300th celebration mm -hmm. and after the celebration a lot of them were relocated um, there were just a few that were put in the right away and that did not come before the board at that time because there wasn't a policy it was just put there there wasn't a policy 
Um, so are you asking specifically about this one or BEARS overall because that's a pretty robust program throughout the city? Um, I guess it, this kind of goes back to the, um, the sidewalk cafe issue whenever that came up. Some folks throughout the city said, well, you know, I want to have uh, dining in my, on my sidewalk in my parking lot and I don't, I'm not downtown. And we told them, well, that's fine. It's private property. Here is when you walk outside of your front door, you're essentially on public property. And that's why downtown is viewed a little bit differently. Um, I guess the board needs to decide if we want to stick with the decision we've made about no monuments, including this would include bears on public property right away. Um, or if there's appetite for the board to have an exception for bears since that's a program that's been around since the 300th celebration. So, does anybody the right have away is the right away, and we made a decision, so we should stick to what we said we're going to do. I think that would be the right thing to do. Okay. Therefore, no one would feel slighted. Foster, again, where do they want to install this mayor? This is on the sidewalk at 206 Craven Street. On the sidewalk? Yes, right, right, right in front of their building. Is there any other bears? Is there any other bears <laughs> position like that throughout the city in front of a business like that? Across the street at Mitchell's Hardware, there is one, and then right here at City Hall uh, at the steps. I'm not aware of any others that are in a right of way throughout the city. How about the bear that got stolen that got replaced right across here at the tourist shop. I'm pretty sure that's. And then there's also the, one the bay of the. the Stuffed bear. Is that what uh, no, it's a wood, a wood, wood, wood okay. carved bear. Um, that one would be one, and then there's one in front of the, the cub house. Natural gas bear. <coughs> the, the, the bears were at the park. There, there are two bears at the park, and then the one in the cub house. I can't remember the cub house. Yeah. Did you say that was Piedmont Natural Gas? No, Piedmont Natural Gas is is by um, the Marriott and the park. This one over here was the welcome. Wagon welcome committee okay. at the Cub House. Would it make a difference as how the store is, is situated? I mean, if they have a, what would it be called, an alcove or something like that, where you, and if the bear was going to be placed in that area, it might make a difference than it just sitting on the sidewalk? This store in question does not have an alcove or anything like that. Okay, so it would be just in front of the store on the sidewalk. That's correct. The one at Mitchell, I can't recall. I know I've seen it. Is it, is it in an alcove or is it is on the it is on the corner of the building right before the parking lot? Okay. Well, my take on it again is if we relax the rules for some, then we are faced with the challenge of other people who again would want the same thing and how can we discriminate to say, well, we allowed it for this one, but we can't allow it for that. Then we looked at the past when this policy was enacted, it was because of these situations. And we have denied people since that time of having the ability to utilize the right of way. So if there's an exception for one, as important as they feel this is, then for other folks who feel it's equally important, for whatever they want a monument, a bear, a statue, or whatever it is, then there goes the policy. So now, the bear can be placed on private property. It can be, yes. And any other type of yeah. markers, flags, whatever. They might have to put the bear inside the store at the window. The, um, I guess the only thing that I would offer is being in that meeting with someone who made a request post the decision of this board not to allow these and they point back to other situations where the city did allow it in the past. I think we, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go along with what the majority of the board says, but I think we just need to be prepared because if I was this business and I wanted to have a bear in front of my business and 
a business right across the street has one that they were allowed to have, that gets back to that question of why were they allowed to have one and me not? And I understand the timing. That was done before there was any decision made by any governing body, but it, it is tricky. Um, and this is probably why you offer to have a policy put in place a while back that we declined not to take up. But um, so I, I've heard two, I think two no's for sure. Anybody else want to chime Did you just say we declined not to put a policy in place? Yeah, the, man, the manager presented a policy and we decided that we didn't want to adopt a policy. We just said that if anybody had a request, they would bring them up individually. There's still an opportunity. I'm sure staff would appreciate having a policy so every time somebody makes a request, they wouldn't have to bring it. Because we could say, for, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we say no to this bear on Craven Street, in two months if somebody says, I want to put a bear on Pollock Street, being we don't have a policy, your direction from this board was to bring it back to us again. We're coming back to you, that's correct. And the reason for that was to make exceptions if we put a policy in place, then as the mayor said, we don't have to have these considerations and discussions every other week. My, my direction or hope would be is that we could get a policy put on our next agenda for us to consider. That way we can kind of put this to rest. I agree. Foster, I don't know whether this is a viable option for the property owner on Craven, but if they have the ability to elevate the bear on a platform attached to their building <laughs> that is high enough that it's not going to be uh, an impediment to pedestrians, is that, a, is that an option that um, we would accept or would it not even apply come to us since it's attached to their building? That, that's correct, Alderman Ashton. That, that would be something for HPC to, to look at to see if that was appropriate or not. And there was, there was an issue about a sidewalk encroachment because I, I think Captain Raddy's wanted to extend out over the sidewalk and that was going to have to have support columns and that was shot down. So. Well, the HPC doesn't regulate the statute, do they? I didn't think they regulated the statutes. No, I think part of the facade. They, well, they have their appearance guidelines that, yes. that they would be able to this. Well, they have a policy think, in place. I think we should put a policy in place also, Barbara. Okay. There's no way to get staff direction. I agree. Five. Okay. So if that lady puts the bear down, that lady should be able to put her marker down. Saying that. Yeah, we're not we're just saying somebody. we're gonna put a policy in yeah. place so we won't have to. Yeah, I know. Get, understand that. I was can't. just making. I was just making a brief statement. And she can't do anything right now. That's correct. Okay. So we will plan on bringing a proposed policy back to the next meeting based on the direction we've got. I'll go ahead and, and, and update you on the other thing. Arma put something in front of, of you. Um, this is regarding the African American historical signs. Back in June of 2021, markers were placed um, in the right-of-way and on private property. There are currently six in the city right-of-way and four on private property. And this was a partnership with the, the Housing Authority, um, Duffyfield, I think Duffyfield Phoenix Group, the Duffyfield Residence Council, several groups that were involved with this back in 2021. Uh, also, the former director of development services work, worked on this to place those markers. And you're going to see a, a letter in front of you, I think it was dated August of 2021, that was sent to the board at the time. And Bernard George made a presentation to that board on September 28th of 2021 on behalf of the committee to make a, um, a request that the city take ownership of those signs and, and, and take care of the maintenance of those signs. And so the direction that we got from the board at that time was for staff in that community to get together to discuss the, the bears that were in the right of way to see if they can be relocated and then to come back to the board uh, for that board to consider. This really did fall off the radar. We had several staff changes uh, in the research we've done. The committee never met with staff after that. And this really just came up a few weeks ago when we were having a discussion uh, with some folks about the other historical marker. And so Carol Beckton actually said something to me about the status of this. And so I thought, well, we need to bring this up to the board. 
And so, Marvin, I'll let you go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, uh, what you put on their tables. Right. Yeah, basically what you have there, uh, there's 10 signs, and the ones that have the red that shows private are the ones that are currently on private property. And, uh, uh, the, the four of them that are on private property, those are the ones you can see where the locations are on one and then the um, GIS location, basically, the best we could do to show you all that they are fairly uh, on the private property just off of the right of way. So the question that we uh, ran into is, uh, I think the question is, are we going to maintain the ones that are on private property or we're going to get, uh, look to have them moved off of the private property onto our right of way and maintain it. So, uh, just looking for some guidance as to what it is we want to do because, uh, according to Bernard George and, and his committee, their understanding was that they gave them to the city and the city was going to maintain them, but uh, that wasn't the, the board's decision. We have not accepted ownership of anything. Uh, we have not accepted ownership. Thank you. Of anything, so the, the question is going to be: Does the city want to consider ownership of this? Now, the board also did not, at that time, did not approve these things being put in the right of way. It was, it was more staff driven for that, and I think some board members were involved with the <coughs> process along the way as well. I also wanted to add that, um, from a legal perspective, our attorney, and I think the reason this got "quote unquote" kicked down the road is. The ones that are on private property, if the city were to take those over, we were going to have to work on getting an easement with those property owners, and the attorney said that was very time-consuming, um, not cost-effective. So that's the reason the previous board said, go figure out these four that are on private property, then come back to us, and let's have that discussion. And like you said, that, that never happened. So I think there is some that are already damaged. There are two over on... Uh Right. Cedar Street. On Cedar Street, it's a it's a tripod one that has two that are currently damaged that will have to be uh, fixed, and that was the other concern was who's responsible for the damaged ones. Um, well, Cedar Street is not listed on this list. It's the um, West. Is it West Street? Uh, the uh, Cray. The Craven. Terrace. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm also, yeah, Craven Terrace housing, number three. Two of those were damaged. Okay. What, is the, what would the cost be in maintenance and doing something like that? So all we know is based on the letter that you have in front of you, the, the, all 10 of those signs cost about $35,000, so about $3,500 total. So what those individual panels would be, could not answer that. We'd have to actually reach out to, to the manufacturer of that to see probably going to be five or six hundred dollars a panel easily. Um, mm. Gifts are very expensive, aren't they? Yes, sir, they are. They're, those aren't, they're, they're like metal signs, probably like digital, digital type. So it's not like a wooden sign that's going to wear out if anything, they'll over time may fade, but uh, the damage that are to the two that, that, that are down, it appears that someone uh, damaged it by hitting the sign and denting them up. So, so why can't these? Sorry. Go ahead. So why can't these um, different um, entities here apply for some grants to to maintain these signs? I believe that the original purchase was through grants, and then, from my understanding, there, this this group, I don't, I do not believe they actually still exist as a group. I think uh, when they when they came together, um, as the New Bern African American Signs of right. History Committee, and then after they been, been finalized the, the turnover in their minds, I, I don't believe the group still exists. Is, is anyone on this board a member of the African American Heritage Museum board? That that may be an option. We could work with them um, to see if they have an interest. I mean, I know that they're very engaged with 
promoting the history in the city. Maybe it's a project um, in perpetuity, kind of like we had talked about earlier. Maybe there's some nonprofits that would like to have a park that they would like to take over and have naming rights for. Maybe it's worth a conversation with that group just to see if they have any interest at all in taking ownership and maintenance of the signs. Just a thought. I, my, my stance for, from, from right now, my stance would be an absolute no on the ones on private property. I don't think that that would be something we would even want to consider. The ones on public property, it's probably worth more conversation and discussion, but definitely not the ones on private property. Yeah, I agree because you're asking for trouble there. You have to go and get an easement. If a truck goes up there and it's too heavy, there's something to the yard. I mean, you, you got it's a lot to go on there. Um, all this has to be rethought out. Is anybody opposed to staff reaching out to the African American Heritage Museum board to see if they have any interest? It's a start. It's a start. Yes, they should do that. And if they say yes, then great, problem solved. If they say no, then we'll just have to revisit and come up with an answer. With a plan. And so there, there are quite a few signs in city right of ways that we don't maintain. And there are signs mm -hmm. that we may own that we've had for years that if it's damaged, a lot mm -hmm. of them don't get replaced for one reason or another. So right. e even if the city uh, decided they wanted to take ownership of this, you're not obligated, the city's not obligated to maintain those things. I don't think that's a, a, a hobby we want to get involved with. Okay, I'm good with that. <laughs> okay, um, board, if you're ready, we can adjourn this meeting and then we'll be back at six o'clock for our regular meeting. So I need a motion. Second. Second. Motion and a second, any further discussion? Mm. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned.